So I'll do a quick intro, but I'm going to really let her introduce herself. <laughs> Sherry Hu is a, a very prominent, very historic feature of the broadcast industry in the Bay Area and elsewhere. Historic? That makes it sound old, like yeah. prehistoric. Yeah. One, of, <laughs> one of the early women reporters out it's there. It's true. That's, and that's, that's something that's really cool. People want to hear about Thank you. that. And uh, a local local gal? Oakland. Oakland. Oh. All that stuff. So she's going to talk a little bit about her career, what it takes to be a journalist. Uh, so she's got some real things. And how that has changed since when she started to when she just recently retired. So I'm going to let her go okay. on, and then we're going to take a lot of questions. So she'll do her thing. We've got a couple of videos to look at, and then we'll do some questions. Sherry, thank Perfect. you. Perfect. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you. I understand this is uh, social media and journalism. Forget about social media, from me at least, OK? We'll talk journalism today. And maybe you can teach me about social media, okay. because that's why I'm here. We always learn something new. That was always my motto to fast forward for a little bit, that to be an excellent journalist, you have to tell yourself you're going to learn something new every day. And sure enough, on every story, there was something I could take away. And that's the beauty of why I did what I did for 30 plus years. 30 plus years, older than some of you in this room. <laughs> but as Jeff mentioned, I'm a product of the Oakland Public Schools. I grew up here. This is still my hometown. I love it. And I'm a big cheerleader for Oakland. So I'm. Really pleased to meet all of you here today. My journalism um, interest started way back, I guess way back in high school. Um, data back to the days when we walked out of class and marched on the Board of Education for the right for girls to wear pants to school. That's, that's a long time ago, but that was something that was very important. So it was the idea of social justice, if you will, and just looking for progress and change in society that got me started. Went to college and thought, everyone thinks that talking about Chinatown, talking about Asian Americans in this country has to do with going to a Chinese restaurant. There's more to it than that. We all look at each other in the room, and none of us are stereotypes. We're all individuals with specific cultural backgrounds, really interesting neighborhood histories and family stories. That's what we should be learning about each other, not, not judging each other on the color of our skin, how we dress, or our gender. So that's what got me interested in journalism and in college, wanting to be on radio and broadcasting it, not just to a few people in class, not just a few people who would listen wherever I happened to be, but to a larger audience. And from radio, that translates from the college radio station to KPFA, then to K101. And then from there, the leap. I needed a job. Applied for a ton, got rejected from at least a dozen till lucky number 13 to apply to the Channel 5 news director for his secretarial job. And I said I would do anything you wanted, minus getting you coffee. Uh, and he hired me. And luckily, he knew that I wasn't going to be there for very long, so he promoted me to the assignment desk. There for a couple of years, learning the ins and outs of TV news and started an apprenticeship. And my first story on the air was on Thanksgiving night. The phone rang once I was home, home fat and sassy and happy that I had eaten so much turkey. And the phone rings, and they say, you've got to get your butt out of bed, and you've got to get to San Francisco to Polk Street. There's been a five alarm fire, and we believe people have died in that fire. Suddenly, the gears shifted, and I was out the door. And the next morning, when I finally went back into the station, I was still an apprentice at that time. And the assistant news director said, you're only an apprentice. We can't put you on the air. You're supposed to be doing fluff stories. I said, wait a minute. You got my butt out of bed. This is a serious story. This is something that I want to own. This is the point where you've just got to do it. And so he put me on the air. It wasn't probably the prettiest story that I've ever done. But it was a start. It was something serious. And six months later, when my apprenticeship was over, he hired me to stay on. And that career lasted from until my retirement from there two years ago. So I really had a wonderful career. It, a, a lot of young journalists start out by going to smaller markets and coming back to one of the top five, say, the Bay Area. <clears throat> 
excuse me, New York, Los Angeles, Boston, Philadelphia. So it was really something special to be here in the Bay Area, to have grown up in the Bay Area, and to be covering stories in my own hometown, which made it all the more personal. And as all of you as journalists know, you can't take things personally, and you can't inject your own personal opinions into your stories. It's not that you can't have them. They just can't be reflected in what you say to the public, which is very important. But it also gives you a sense of, of fairness when you grew up someplace and you want to see, in the rules of journalism, both sides presented and with truth and honesty, that you just don't want to see a headline being produced about your city, your hometown. You want to make sure the real story gets out. And I think that's what drives a lot of journalists. It's a passion to get the real story out and to share stories that other people wouldn't get to see. That I can share real stories of Oakland, of Berkeley, of San Leandro, of anywhere in the East Bay, which was my beat, to people who probably wouldn't stop in going from the Bay Bridge to the Caldecott Tunnel. And it happens. I've worked with people who wouldn't stop. So it was important for them to see the real stories that are here, the stories of all of you, the stories of all your families, the story of your neighbors, that it's really important. Um, which brings me, and I will get off that for a minute, how I, I think the, the whole point of this, too, is how journalism has changed. When I first started working the streets, I worked with a live van and with two people. There was a photographer and there was a sound person, because in those days, we didn't just have a little tiny camera that you could just tuck under your arm and, yeah, go, oh, it's a few pounds. No, we had these big clunker things. There was a machine that was about this big with a tape in it that was this big that you had to sling around one shoulder or actually it would be this way if you're right-handed. So you sling this huge box, which was the recorder on this, on this side of your body. And on this side, you have a camera that probably weighed, what, do you think 20, 25 pounds? Easily, easily. So you're sort of balancing like this. So there were two people. There was a sound person, technician, who would do the live shots, and then the photographer. And we had someone back at the station who would edit the stories. And then my job would be to get the story, to produce it, to write it, and go on the air. By the time I retired, you're looking at the crew, me. I had to drive to my stories. I had to set up my stories, write my stories, shoot my stories, edit my stories, and start it at 9 in the morning and get it on the air at 5 o'clock for a live shot. The only thing I didn't do was to engineer the live shot. And trust me, if you ever want a stomach ache, or get investment in Tums, in antacids, that's the way to do it. Would you like to play it? Yeah, let's take a look. And then you can judge for yourself whether it's worthwhile or not. And you know, this is the new movement, so please judge for yourself whether. But one of the, why don't you, while I'm setting this up for a sec, if I can interject. Sure. Because I, I always instill, you know, we start on time and that sort of thing. I mean, in, in oh, yeah. broadcast. Oh. And we're standing out there for the live shot, and they're talking in your and, and you know the countdown. You don't go, oh yeah, I'll, I'll be there in about three or four minutes. Oh, well, you know, you're on, and that's pretty stressful, that, isn't it? That really is. Well, not only that, writing the stories after it's on the air, I'll, I'll, if if I don't bore you all too much, and you can just tell me to stop and cut when when I do get to that point, because I can talk forever, uh, that I will explain to you just what's involved in this. But truly, yeah. when you write your stories, seconds count. I've had producers call me back and say, hey, you went two minutes on that story? You got to cut 10 seconds, because if all of you go 10, 20 seconds over, I'm going to run out of time for my other stories. Can you imagine someone making a big deal of 10 seconds? And that's what they do yeah. in print, right? All right, the words count. You, you, if they say you want a story with 200 words, you've got to be 200 words, not 201, 200. Same thing. All right, here we go. So this is the new Neldums. So this is the new Neldums, and this is a feature story, which is. says it was close to. Yeah, sure. I'll stand back. It's the old countdown. It's pretty old fashioned. They came and they bought, and bought, and bought. By lunchtime, the newly owned Taste of Denmark says it was close to sold out and starting a second round of baking. I had very high hopes that this would be the day, that everything would be well. Uh, it's great to see everybody here. 
a lot of customers came, not just to satisfy a sweet tooth fix, but because this is where they've come for years. The site of the former Neldum's Bakery in Oakland is bustling again, but with different owners, a different name, and different recipes. No matter, tradition is tradition for Liotta Poston. Today, she brought her two great-grandchildren, just like her mother brought her when she was a child. Every Sunday, every birthday, every holiday, this is the place we would come to make special orders for cakes and cookies. I'm told 40% of Taste of Denmark is now owned by the building's owners, 20% will be sold to investors, and the other 40% belongs to former Neldum's workers, like Kathy Colquette, who started here almost 30 years ago, and she started her own tradition here. Her daughter Trina has been helping behind the counter for 13 years. When you're ready, I can help you. And now Coquette's teenage granddaughter, Stephanie, is on board. For those who've been coming for years, there are still some few old temptations, the strawberry cakes, chocolate dreams, and cheesecakes. But keep in mind, this, the owners emphasize, is no longer Neldum's. It's a, a new bakery, a new tradition, and a new birth. Sure, it may all be new, but for customers who've passed on the tradition from generation to generation, this spot is more than what meets the mouth. It's not just a bakery, no. No, this is a heart of Oakland. This is definitely the heart. Mm -hmm. Because it ended abruptly like that because they came back to us live. And, they, and, it, and it's exactly two minutes. Two minutes, yeah. Right. So now you shot all that? I shot this. So I start the day, so I can't remember the time I was there, probably about 10, 30, 11 o'clock in the morning, started shooting, and if you shoot video, you understand what sequencing is and how you have to edit carefully, so you have to look at everything. The lighting changes as you move around. You have to listen because you want good natural sound. So yes, I shot everything and then I go back to this little van, these little white transit vans. We call them our little dairy trucks. And um, in the back I have this countertop. So I have um, a PC laptop to my left. I have an Apple laptop on my right and a cell phone to my ear calling in. So I'm writing on the PC. I write my story and communicate to the station via the PC. And then I'm loading on the video and logging it so I can listen for my sound and get my information on the Apple. And then as soon as I finish writing my script and they approve it, then I turn this way and start editing. And then I still have to edit and get it in no later than 4.30 because they need to zip it in there through the skies and they need to get it queued up on the other end, and then we need to prepare for our live shot. So all that was actually done by about 4.30, and then we were on the air, I think it was maybe 5.15, 5.20, inside Neldum's. And they send out a satellite truck to do that. Yes, yes. They changed it, they have to convert it to an mm -hmm. iMovie, and then there's some little box that they, some converter, we tried a couple of different, I'm not a tech person, you can tell when I say stuff, box, this, this, like sort of, sort of electronic things, it's not my thing. <laughs> I can deal with words, but not technical. But they had to get another converter box in order to make it work, because all the formats that we've been through, I mean, there was DVC Pro, there's beta tapes, I mean, and then finally they get to this and all these different different generations of video, that digitally it was much different than feeding in tape, and, and the um, live vans did not like it. They did not mesh well at all in the beginning. You know Final yeah. Cut Pro, yes. And, and we, were, we were given a boot camp for, for shooting, so we had a, a week of training on the camera, similar to probably this one and a week of training on Final Cut Pro. And then it was off. And then they just said, whatever you feel comfortable doing, just push the limits and, until you want to say stop. And if you think you can do it, do it. Yes? So the transition you're talking about of a typical team of four turning into a team of just you, um, when, when did that transition really occur? And was that sort of a widespread thing? Or, uh, no, 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 when, not why. Oh, when? Of course I know why. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, 
anyone who says that there, there are many people who believe, um, and, and, it's, and it's no bull, that journalism should be information for people and for society. But it's also a business, just like baseball and football are businesses. And in a business, you want to make money. No secret to that. Um, but the transition to a one-person unit started with Channel 4, and that was probably, I want to say, six years ago, do you think? Right. Yeah. It, or it may even have been longer. And then Channel 5 went to it then, well, no, it's probably longer than six years because with I... When, when they sold right. Ryan, yeah. Right, probably and then that. Channel 5 did this maybe three, three years ago. But now they're not doing, and, and there were also um, conditions going out on your own. In other words, if you were going out on something, some story where you're going to be running around and chasing and, I, I don't know, some, a march, say, that they would not send one person because it's impossible to do both. And besides, I mean, we're not, I, I can do this, but it, it's not. I didn't, I didn't train in the business for 20 years to shoot stories. I'm not a trained photographer. I leave that up to the experts. Well, actually, and that's the question I had, and which is why I pulled up this picture of the strawberries up there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so you went from being a, a classic reporter, mm -hmm. you had your notepad, you mm -hmm. interview people, the, mm -hmm. the, the sound and camera people would be over here, you'd be writing your script, and then you'd do the thing, they'd do all these shots for you. How did you learn or make the transition to know, because you guys, no matter what media you get into, it's going to be TV, radio, or newspaper. Like we said, you'll probably end up shooting video at some point. So how are, all, are all of you going to shoot video at some point? Probably. Or just for fun. But hold, let me finish my question then. Yeah. yeah. But so how did you instinctively, or did you instinctively know, did they train you to go, okay, you got to get a close-up of the strawberry? How did you know to do that? Some, some of it is over the years. So on every story, contrary to what you might believe, reporters do write their own, or many reporters write their own stories. So in order to write a good story, you need to know what your subjects are saying. So I have to, I have to look at all of my raw video, both the video, the VO, and also listen to my sound in my interviews in order to hear what you people know, are saying voiceover. word for word, so I can pick out my little snippets of my interview there, sound bites. So I think probably after working with some of the best in the business, that your eye sees the same way. I, I will know what a good shot looks like, but the challenge is then doing it yourself and recreating it. I, I think that's, that's the big deal, because there are, there are um, a number of excellent reporters who just couldn't get into this. I mean, you really, it's, it's a challenge to be using one part of your brain and then suddenly the other part. And yes. then here, I just want to show this. Now, this is another picture that a pretty unusual angle there. You had to get down or hold yeah. the camera like that, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, probably if you weren't trained or didn't have a lot of experience, you'd just go up and go <clears throat> put the, the camera in the person's <laughs> face. But this is what makes kind of a good visual story is different angles and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So go ahead, sir. Yes. I just wanted to compliment you. I think your video was awesome. I mean, that just. Thank I mean, you. I bet you. Just, I mean, the filming, the lighting, that the voiceover, everything. I mean, and Thank you. You, you took a, a crash camp on this, so I think you did an excellent job. I mean, Actually, w would you mind if I just showed you one more story, the very first one I did that was outdoors? Is that the playground one? Yes, yeah, that, disabled. That's a great one. You like that. I that's like why, that. if you don't mind. But I would love to have interaction, because I love it if you're asking the questions, because this is your class. Yeah. This is the first one you did single-handedly, right? Yes. Check and this was not on. Um, and this was not Final Cut Pro. This was when we were still reel-to-reel -reel tape. So DVC Pro. It's really quite simple. Playground plus kids equals laughter. But for Logan Raglan, it's more about subtraction than addition. I realized how very little there was at the park that he could participate in. Today, though, is a new day. With ramps on both ends, San Francisco now has its first play structure that allows children with disabilities to get to the top. That's a big hill, isn't it? Without any coaxing, Logan is more than happy to lead the way. His mom, Erica Raglan, says at 20 months old, Logan was diagnosed with a life-threatening neuromuscular disease, spinal muscular atrophy. And it affects crawling, walking, 
um, really everything that we take for granted every single day, and it's progressive, which means that he will continue to weaken over his lifetime. But as you can see, Logan is adjusting to racing around in his red racer and thinks this above the ground view is pretty cool. Trust me, it was tough keeping up with him. Our district nine supervisor is here. After being closed for more than a year, today's grand opening of St. Mary's Playground was a huge neighborhood event. And it was appropriate for children to lead the ceremonial ribbon cutting. Reckon Park says a bond measure is paving the way for the remodel of 13 playgrounds citywide. So money's not the hurdle to building more accessible structures like this one, it's space. St. Mary's is also an example of taking the Americans with Disability Act a step further. The law only requires that a child in a wheelchair can get to the park. This goes beyond what is required by law. It's really about doing the right thing for kids with disabilities. And Logan's mom understands all too well. For me, it says that Logan is entitled to a childhood, just like any other child, and that's exactly what he is. He's entitled to play alongside all of his peers and learn all of those lessons and have all of the same fun that they're having. And for me, that's invaluable. It's just exactly what I want for my son. It's just what every other child has. It is. Cut to the live shot. Exactly. Thank you. So that presented its own challenges in the sense that it was outdoors and a little boy mobile. Really, I mean, it really was incredible trying to keep up with him. He would just zip along and I said, Logan, Logan. And I'd be running along trying to find him. So there you go. If you get into journalism today, this is your future. <laughs> yes. It came in as a press release that they were opening up this new playground. Um, and then it was up to me to take the release, call some of the organizers, and find out who was going to be there. Because clearly, what I think makes a story, um, what makes you feel about a, a story about a disabled playground is obviously finding someone who's going to use it and someone who needs it. You personalize a story, as you've learned being journalists. That's how you take a big picture story and issue and make people care about it, is you find someone who's affected by it. And sure, it sounds like it's a cliche, but, but truly, when, when you pick up the newspaper, when you read a story, when you go on the net, how do you relate to it through someone else's eyes? And it was through Logan and his family that this story needed to be told in that way, in the proper way. Putting the human face on Yes. Exactly, yes. How long did it take you to like, find stories? To find stories? Every day we have to come up with, or we had to come up with our own stories, and you do it by, say, coming here, talking to some of you, oh, is there something going on? And you hear about something that's going on in the neighborhood. Sometimes it's driven by the news itself. Um, in Las Vegas, there was a young rapper who was murdered, and his family, and He's, he grew up in Oakland, so that would have been a natural Oakland story. Um, there are other ways. We read the newspaper, <laughs> and I hate to say, but people steal stories or borrow. But that's how you generate ideas. But, but hold this question just for one second. So it might be important, because we were talking about uh, newspapers and, mm -hmm. and, and big media outlets like PBS mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and how they have an editorial process as opposed to folks that are you know, blogging and citizen reports. Oh. Why don't, you, why don't you walk these guys through the editorial process? The, the decision itself, and I'm sorry, I don't mean to stand in that corner. I'll just keep moving around. But, um, but the decision to come up with a story starts in the morning where I'll look through the newspapers. I'm listening to the radio, going online, or talking to people, or maybe I have something from the night before. By 8 o'clock, I would call the assignment desk and talk to the boss there and say, OK, this is what I have. What do you have on the wires? They have Bay City wires, so they know some of the events that are coming up. If there are any um, court cases we need to cover, if there are any press conferences we need to go to. And not only do we need to go to them, but in what form? Do you cover a press conference just to get 30 seconds of it to show in the newscast, or does it turn into a full-blown two-minute story? So those are things you have to decide. Because probably, typically, if they weren't testing us as part of 
our boot camp to try to see how far we could get doing stories like Disabled Playground. It very well could have been that that story could have turned into only, say, 30 seconds of video of, uh, say, the ribbon cutting and of, of kids playing in a playground. But because that particular day we were looking for a story that I could cover as, as a multimedia journalist, that's the buzz in MMJ, that they were looking for things that were simpler that we could do one-stop shopping. So that's why we did that. So there are all these judgments that are made day to day, depending on what's going on and what other reporters are covering and what the big news is of the day. And then after I call in and we have our little discussion, then they go into a more general meeting with the producers, the news director, um, a lot of the other reporters, whoever's based in San Francisco, and then they mull it over there and then they call us back and they say, okay, you pitched X story, go, or this they like better, go and then that's how the day gets started. So it's a collective decision, which is good and it's bad, because you have to consider where people live, what their backgrounds are. Um, say you have a newsroom, and I'm not saying that this is how our newsroom was, but say you had a newsroom of people who are making decisions who say only come from San Francisco. What do they know of San Jose or Oakland or Walnut Creek or Marin? So that's where they rely on our input, bureaus from Santa Clara, reporters who live there, reporters who live in, in the East Bay, to tell them what's important. Yes? Um, I have two questions for you. Um, I mean, is, it, is it harder now to do a story than it is from back then, when you first started? And, 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 the, the and, and define harder in terms of what kind as of? In, as in, as in work-wise, as in like back then, did you have to work less on a story than you would now because you're working by yourself? Like you, you're doing everything by yourself now, so you, you know back then you weren't—you were, you had people who were doing certain things that you would do now. So let me you, answer that one first, okay. then before you get to the other one. Short attention span. <laughs> that it, it's harder in the sense that as a reporter, as a trained reporter, and not a trained photographer or sound person or editor, that I like to focus on the story. And that when you have one person doing everything, you feel you're going to miss something. It's inevitable you're going to miss something. You're going to miss a good shot. You're going to miss a good fact. You're going to miss something. And from the reporter's point of view, because that's my training, I don't want to miss a good fact. I don't want to miss not asking something. And then thinking just before I go on the air, oh, crap. You know, that's what I needed. I, I, I don't want to think like that ever. And that's where I think that you lose when you, when you move to this kind of system. That's why I think it can be acceptable and it can work for some stories, probably more feature stories, lighter stories, but when you get to more controversial stories, more meteor stories, stories with a lot of substance and need a lot of background work, that, that is going to be that's where I would draw the line. But in, for some people, for some reporters, in some markets, there is no choice anymore. There is no line to draw. You can't turn it down. If they say do it, you've got to do it. At our place, at least, because we were in this transition period, we were able to talk about our limitations or what stories we felt were going to be acceptable as a one-man band version and which ones would not. That was a luxury that I'm not sure many newsrooms are going to be able to accept it in the future. You had a second question too, right? Um, you say that you, you, you do every day um, a reporter or a journalist, or a journalist has to come up with their own story. No, is that pertaining to back then too? Like back then, when you first started, is, is it more than you, you, you came up with your own stories, period? as if to now where they, where they give you stories and you come up with your own stories? It's story. always a give and take. It's always a give and take. It's probably 50-50. Um, <laughs> back then, I worked the other end of it because I worked the assignment desk, and so I was setting up stories and telling reporters, this is what you're doing today. Until, until we got into it so many times, I said, well, maybe I should try the other side. And that's when I made the transition. Yes. Did you know of any instances where um, a photographer or videographer can make the transition to like a reporting one-man band? You, said? you can see them on the air now. They're um, on Channel 5. Don Ford and Patrick Cedillo are two people who come to mind who work, I think, on weekdays and sometimes in the morning. They're photographers. 
Um, and Jen Garrison, um, the only woman photographer still on staff at Channel 5. And so if you see any of them. But it may be subtle. Um, my ear can hear it. I don't know. It would be interesting that if we put up a sampling of a dozen stories for you to watch, some that were done by one person who's background is a photographer or someone who's a reporter or someone who did it with a photographer, whether you'd be able to tell the difference or not. Yeah, that, that, that would be. To see to the trained eye, to a, to a viewer, what you see and what the differences are and were there any deficiencies, anything lacking? Yes. Uh, two questions, actually. Follow up to that topic. Do you? I mean, you said um, that in this one-man band or one-woman band sort of outfit, um, that a lot of attention to detail is lost. Do you feel like quality has decreased as a result too? Like yes. Like, oh yes. Like significantly, do you think that the fact that like all these jobs being done down by one person like is severely drop the quality yes. that might contribute to less people watching news, which is less money, which is more to work that each person has to do. I mean, it's, it's like a snowball effect. Yeah, we, if we take that element out of it, that it's not purely a grousing that, oh, well, I, I, I don't want to do that because that's just too much work or before I could take a lunch break and now I can't, it, it has nothing to do with that. Um, before we, we barely had time for lunch and then after we, we had no time for lunch. Period. But no, I think it's a matter of quality. Um, but also, that being said, that a number of people who are getting into the business, and actually at the time when I first started, in smaller markets, that's what, that's what reporters were trained to do. They were actually trained in, in small towns where they couldn't afford to hire a huge staff in, in smaller markets, that you had to shoot and report on your own. But I think at that point, too, there were also editors. So you're not doing everything, and maybe you weren't doing a live shot. And, and then again, the stakes aren't as high. I mean, in the Bay Area, you have a very, and I look to all of you, you have a very intelligent, sophisticated viewership. And, and I think to give people anything less than that is a disservice. As somebody who has uh, who has written and has done a little bit of work on a radio show, how do you break that barrier from? I mean, freelance writing. Yeah, you email the editor, say if they need freelancers. How do you break the barrier from just writing to to, to actual broadcasting to doing to doing the voice aspect and the, and the physical aspect as well? Because it was so long ago for me, and because I was sort of I was starting out in reporting, I'm not really a good example of that. Probably a better example is Mike Sugarman who's on Channel 5, who, who is still on radio on KCBS, and he's also very successful in TV. I think it's just, I think it's partly the personality, too, how far people are willing to go out. Because in my mind, being a good reporter is all about writing. And then you look for the video, and that comes as an added element. It's, it's like the icing on the cake. But first, your writing has to be solid. So if you go in with a, a solid writing background, learning the visuals will come if you allow it to. And if you allow, if you work with someone who's good and you allow that person to do it for you too. And to guide you through it. And also the voice training too. Mm -hmm. And also voice training too. I mean, you can, you can write very well and not be able to speak very well. Exactly. Really, yeah, you have to have a background in some kind of broadcast voice training or something like that. But, believe it or not, I mean, everyone will tell you that even when voice coaches come in, they tell you that the best way to sound is like yourself. And granted, I guess I don't talk like this, <laughs> like after, especially after a glass of wine or something. But, <laughs> but the whole point is that that to be successful and to get your point across too, that you want to come across as you. I I don't I don't I don't know exactly how else to put that, but I can remember when we all first started out as women, because as Jeff mentioned, we were early on women and women of color, but. Diane Feinstein, when she was mayor of Oakland, and I, uh, excuse me, San Francisco, and I know I'm going way back, she had the, the classic like power woman outfit, the blazers and then these blouses with these big ties. And, and we were all into it. I mean, there's this uniform. I mean, you can even see to a certain extent, if you look at archives of, of TV stations throughout the years, there was a time when everyone wore blazers, men and women. They wanted that look. It's kind of like, Creating that style and half, half being the blazer, being the masculine look, right? Power. 
and then half the bow tie part, the, the, the feminine part, which she put her signature on. So it's just very interesting, the evolution of, of looks and you know, projection, image projection, branding, if you will, yeah. too. And now, now in HD, it's re you got to look really perfect. <laughs> if yeah. you want to be an anchor, I'm seriously. Every little flaw everywhere. Yeah. You know, dog hair on the lapel. Yeah. Could be the end of the career. <laughs> Yes. Um, so for the um, <coughs> videos that you have to do now, how, um, like, what's your limit for the day? How long do those take? And if you, if you have to do, um, if you have to do a segment, can you do multiple segments in a day? Is that something that's, that's like, how, how tough is it to finish up one? It's tough enough to finish up one. And you know, I retired from there a couple of years ago. I now work right across the street at KDOL. Um, the Oakland School District's TV station. In fact, last night we just finished, if you don't mind, a, a, a doubleheader, a back-to-back -back, uh, town hall with 14 students from throughout Oakland. In our first hour block, we, um, the guest speaker was uh, OPD Chief Howard Jordan and his lieutenant who works um, with youth services. And then the second hour was with the school district's chief of police, James Williams. And it, it was a very interesting two-hour segment. It was very lively, and it, it was uh, very constructive, I hope. So I'm sorry. So I'm, I'm no longer there, but it's a challenge to do. Um, at one point in, in the trend and the movement, because everything changes in broadcasting, that there was a time when they wanted you to do a full story like that, plus two shorter versions, and maybe go out to two, one or two other stories. Yeah. Within an eight-hour day. Right. Well, that's what I was going to say. So from the time you start in the morning mm -hmm. till when you finish at night for a two-minute piece plus several versions, how many hours was that? Well, you figure if you're talking in the morning, say you're up and you're looking through newspapers and doing whatever from 7 to 8, you make a call in the station at 8 o'clock. Then you're getting ready, and then by maybe 9, 9.30, you get an assignment, and then you start making calls on that story. And maybe you're on both the 5 and the 6 o'clock, and instead of being in Oakland, where we based our office, you're in uh, Benicia. So by the time you're home after a 6 o'clock live shot, or it's maybe 7.30. Long day. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, I'm more interested in when in the old days when you were at CalX and uh, oh. <laughs> and then what did you do at KPFA? If you could just talk about those days a bit and what you learned there. Radio, uh, um, I love radio because radio um, radio involved tape, and I just love the concept that you can you can listen to reels. You actually t had to take a razor blade, and I think some of that is done now as well. Besides digitally, there there's still some archives that they use that you have to cut and then splice and put a little piece of scotch tape there. But I think radio is fun because it really trains you to be a good journalist because you are dependent on words. We were talking about words, right? That words count because people are listening. They don't have the advantage of the visuals of seeing something, which helps you when you're trying to explain something where people can see there, there's an added element there that radio, you're only listening. So you really have to be descriptive. You really have to be graphic in your words. You have to be a voracious reader in order to have an incredible vocabulary because you really want to paint this picture of what you're seeing. That's what I loved about radio. And it's so honest, too, that I think it's much cleaner than television because of, because of that. It's, it's this element where you don't have anything else that's added. It's you and the person you're interviewing, that's it. Um, produced a show called Asian Media. And so with a group of other people in collective, we had an hour-long program once a week. Um, when was that? 70s. Yes. And it was funny because Bill Schechner, if you obviously keep up at the time, uh, we ended up working together. But he was a program director then. We didn't know each other until we met at KPFA. Is anyone else here a KPFA fan? Yeah. Larry Bensky? Yeah. Because Larry was there too. Larry, when, hmm? yeah. I mean, a, a lot of a lot of journalists got their start. If you grew up here in the Bay Area, it was with radio. It's not in TV. It's in radio, and everyone. And I guess in that sense, you do make the transition, and then people, 
you do it you do it slowly. Sugarman's the only one I know has done it successfully in just making the jump like boom, being a, a seasoned veteran, successful radio reporter, and then making that leap. Yes. I just want to ask you, do you have like any uh, career goals that you want to transition into? You know, like talk show or working with students. Just working with students. Seriously, because I'm a product of the um, public schools here in Oakland, that um, it's just getting them to do whatever they want and helping them achieve their own dreams, too. What about Belva Davis's old job this, this week in Northern California? I'm sure they have a great replacement picked. I, I haven't <laughs> seen anyone yet that I like. <laughs> yes. We have. As a matter of fact, they usually participate in these um, town hall discussions we have, but this time they didn't. And I know that they're busy fundraising and all, but we have. Very talented group. Um, Holly Kwan, who's working KCBS now, I remember listening to her stories on, um, on KCBS when she was with Youth Radio. I think they do an incredible job. It's a great venue. So we Are we running out of time? Uh, I'm sorry. About five more minutes, so okay. See, I told you I can be long-winded. Sorry? But any last questions? Yeah. Talking about students at community radio, what advice would you give a young person, especially a young person of color who wants to go into journalism or into your, your field? What advice would you give them? I guess it depends on what form of journalism, which form of media you want to do. I would never discourage anyone from trying to get into television. In fact, I encourage it. As daunting as all this seems, I, I would say if any of you have the desire to do it, go for it. And I want you to do it and just go in there and just fight and challenge yourself and challenge the newsroom and the people who run it to go in there and to do your thing. I wouldn't shy away from anything because I think now more than ever that people need to get involved. And to me, journalism is an active way of making sure that your voice is heard. So I say do it. And I want to all add, forms. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I want to add to what Sherry said is imagine all that that she said that she did. On top of that now reporters have to tweet, keep their Facebook Oh yeah, up. and I didn't even do that. None of that stuff. Like, they have to take you know still photos probably to put on the website. And oh still that. still photographers for the trip. They're out there with video. the combo camera, and I was looking at one day, I said, what are you doing? He says, oh, now we're doing video. Well, that's what I was going to say. So even if yeah. you're a newspaper reporter, you're going to have to shoot video yeah. because they want the little, you know. Right. So this is all. They're this. blogging. They're doing, they're doing podcasts. Um, print people are doing podcasts, so they're doing audio. Yeah. Right. So it's the whole thing. So. Your brain will explode. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, last question. Overload. Last couple, go. Uh, pretty sure I know the answer, but journalists don't get paid more for doing all that extra work. Oh, do they? Less. <laughs> Less. That's oh. the whole point of going to multimedia journalism. Gotcha. Okay. Last you can hire fewer people, lower salary rates. Yeah. Okay. Your, your capitalist dream. Last question. Ah. <laughs> I just want to ask. Um, did you start off like you, in the union when you first started? I'm sorry, did I? Did you start off like in the union? Or, or have you ever been union? I, yes. Okay. Um, union, when I started the apprenticeship, it was an AFTRA an apprenticeship <sighs> until I retired. Okay. And if I ever get back into it, all I have to do is start paying dues again. I'm still. I know I was going to ask if you're coming to the meeting next month. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> no, no longer dues paying. There you go. Let's thank Sharon very much. Thank you, all of you. Thank you to all of you. So go out and do it, and then I'm going to come back, and all of you can teach me social media, okay? Because that's what I'm trying to learn now. So good deal? Thank you, everyone.